good to see everyone today. Uh, when my sermon PowerPoint uh, was put into the, uh, the song presentation, it's imported in, it messed up one of the fonts. So uh, I hope all of the slides are at least readable. I understand, yeah. No, it's not the problem. The problem was that font wasn't in the, on the computer. Uh, that's my fault. But anyway, um, so if, if you can't see it, then hey, go to, West, go to the YouTube channel and, and listen to it again, and it'll be right there over my shoulder, and it'll look really pretty, so we'll see, see how that goes. We're thankful for all who are here. We're very grateful for the fact that we have such a good number, and we have several who are visiting with us. We're thankful for that as well. Um, we have had uh, a pretty light attendance the last two Sundays because of the holiday seasons. We had a lot traveling. Uh, for the most part, I think that everyone is home. We have several who are out uh, due to illness and a couple who are out because they're recuperating from surgery. We look forward to seeing them again. But it is such a wonderful thing uh, as we begin this, this new year to, to understand the most important thing that should be uh, in our lives, each and every one of us, is worshiping God. And this opportunity that we have on the Lord's Day to come together and to worship Him and to please Him and to and to receive encouragement ourselves as a part of our worship is something that is such a benefit, such a blessing for us. And I hope and pray that you feel that way. And I hope and pray that what we have discussed and studied and, and uh, the way we have worshiped today has been helpful to you. And I, of course, certainly pray that it has been pleasing to God. I, I very much appreciated the song service today, both in the 9 a.m. hour as well as uh, this hour. The... Uh, the, pre- the psalms that are found in the book that are put to music that is familiar to us, there are quite a few of them, and I've led them from time to time, just one psalm at a time. I don't get to lead singing very often, but I've chosen those things. But to have an entire um, uh, assembly that is, that is kind of tied in with those psalms, they're so rich, uh, such wonderful sentiments that are expressed there. And the wonderful thing about it is we don't have to try to, to learn a new psalm. We know what the... the The tune is so we can concentrate on those words, and they are indeed encouraging. Uh, The text that was read this morning from Ephesians chapter 4 is the uh, text that we're going to be sharing with you today. I had uh, it read in uh, in its entirety uh, in verses 17 through 24, so you may want to turn there. We'll spend a majority of our time discussing that again today. While the word light is not found in the text... Uh, the idea of contrasting light and darkness certainly is. And um, I do want to note that the Bible often does this, uh, this metaphor that is used uh, to describe what are, in fact, uh, completely uh, contrasting and, and opposing aspects of our existence, light and darkness. Uh, we attribute in Scripture... Uh, the concept of light as being that which is righteous. Um, it has reference and is associated with God, with good, with what is spiritual and what is acceptable to him. And when you look at the word darkness as it is commonly found in scripture, it attributes that which is evil, uh, that which is associated with Satan and his works, with immorality, with things that are carnal and unacceptable to God. And you wonder about that light and darkness. A very good way of explaining it that I thought is interesting is that, that what darkness is, is the absence of light. Uh, I used to have a, an essay that was written by someone about light bulbs. And it's very interesting because the premise was is that light bulbs are not really light bulbs, they're dark suckers. And what they do is just suck in all the darkness. That darkness is what exists, and, and, uh, and, and basically light is just the absence of darkness. In other words, turning everything on its head, but we know that's not so. And so when we talk about light and darkness, in effect, uh, spiritually, when we talk about light, is that is the illumination of God. We are in the presence of God. We're in a relationship with God. We are walking in the light. And if God's not there, his presence is not there, then what we are in is In fact, darkness. Jesus, when he came to this earth, came to bring light into the world. In John chapter 3, he used this language in verses 19 through 21. John 3, verses 19 through 21. When he said that this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. 
Everyone practicing evil hates the light, does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. Of course, we want to be in that relationship with God. We want to experience uh, that light. And, And so when we say these things, the question comes, how do we differentiate? Now, we know that physically it's an easy thing. You turn the flash, the, you turn the switch on if it's dark and it becomes light. And we, we understand the difference between light and darkness. But the un- interesting thing about that is that when we talk about spiritual matters, you realize people are often confused about what is light and what is darkness. In fact, the prophet Isaiah made reference to this in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20 when he pronounced a woe to those who call evil good. And call good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That's what the world sometimes do. The world does. Sorry. And so you can, you can even see that that is the case in the political discourse of our day. As you look at the talking heads on television, you hear the protests and such. Those things that are Christian values are considered by some just because... They're found in the Bible, and just because they are followed by individuals who count them as God's word, they're extreme. And and actually, the condemnation of sin that's found in the Bible is itself proclaimed as evil by a majority of the world because they have reached that point to where they call, in effect, light darkness and darkness light. And so we ask the question, how do we differentiate? And that's the subject that's under consideration in our, our text. Now, the main section of our study is verses 20 through 24, but I think it's important to establish some context. To begin with verse 17 of the text, Now, I want you to read with me through verse 19. We'll make a few points. This I say, therefore, testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to licentiousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now, as you look at that particular context, you notice the darkening of understanding is characteristic here of the Gentiles. Now, why is the word Gentile used in this regard? It is used almost pejoratively. The description is given of those who are ungodly are Gentiles. And the reason for that is because of the reality of what existed in the first century. The Jews, they were the chosen people of God. They had been illuminated with the law of of Moses. You may remember in, in John chapter uh, 4, as he talked with the Samaritan woman at the well, he said, we Jews know what we worship because there was revelation from God in that regard. But the Gentile nations typically were involved in idolatry. And that idolatry typically was associated with immorality. In fact, as a part of the pagan religion, typically was prostitution. You had what were referred to as temple prostitutes, and it was something, again, that was very typically involved with and a part of the worship to those idols. And so it's not surprising that when you talk about evil and evil people that the word Gentile is used in Scripture. That's the way the Apostle Paul uses it here in this particular text. It's because the Gentiles no longer retain God in their knowledge. In fact, that's what is stated in Romans chapter 1. And verse 21 of the text, Romans 1, we'll read verses 21 through 23. We are told that these Gentiles, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. That's the Gentiles. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into corruptible things. Things like an image made like corruptible man. Birds, four-footed animals, and creeping things. You ever thought that was a peculiar thing? That men would fashion an idol. And they would, they would make the idol look like a bird. Or make the idol look like a jackal, as the Egyptians did. Or make them look like some four-footed beast. And then they would, after they had fashioned that, in accord with their own imaginations, they would put it in their home and they would bow down and worship that 
stone idol. It's absurd. And it is, again, the indication of a foolish mind, a mind that has become futile, and it has been darkened because they no longer retain the almighty God of heaven in their minds. That's what the Apostle Paul said in Acts 17 with regard to the Athenians. Those Athenians were very religious individuals. They had altars to all of the various Greek gods, even to one that they thought they might have missed, an altar to the unknown god. And and Paul said, he is the one that I declare to you. And he's not like these gods made with hands. He is not worshipped by men as though he needed anything. He is the creator of all things. He can be limited to a place. He is the Almighty, but people don't remember that. And as a result of not remembering and often willfully being ignorant, well, they they are darkened in their thinking. And so that's how the Ephesians once conducted themselves. They were as the Gentiles, but he said, no longer should you be this way. Notice in verse 20 of Ephesians 4, he said, you've not so learned Christ. This is the way you were, but when it comes to Christ and what you have learned in Christ, this should no longer be the case. If you have heard him, have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, you are to put off concerning the former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. Be renewed in the, the spirit of your mind and put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. In the very next chapter, in verse 17, or excuse me, verse 8 of Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5 and verse 8, it says, You once were in darkness, or once were darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. So what are you to do? He says, You are to walk as children of light. So let's consider, as we go to the next slide, it's okay, not too bad. When we look at the next slide, I want you to note to consider where the different walks come from. You'll notice specifically again with verses 17 through 19, where does the darkness come from? What is it? He says, you no longer walk. Notice the word walk as the Gentiles walk. Notice the concept of futility of mind and understanding darkened, and it is because of ignorance. So we consider this, such darkness is alienation from the life of God and the light of God. That's why in passages such as in in Revelation 21, the description of the New Jerusalem, do you remember in the New Jerusalem we are told that the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it? Why would it not need the sun or the moon? Well, because the glory of God illuminated it. You see, God and light. Being in fellowship with God brings you into that illumination. The Lamb is its light. The nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings will bring glory and honor to it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, and there shall be no night there. Why? Because you're in the presence of the Almighty, which is, again, the presence of light. But without God in our lives... Then we're walking in darkness. The darkness is present in the lives of those who engage in wrong actions, who walk, in effect, as the Gentiles walk. Remember what John said in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 6 concerning the walk that we have? He says there, if we say that we have fellowship with God, but we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. You can be lying to others. I'm I'm walking in the light. I am in fellowship with God. But you're walking in darkness. You're lying. You don't have fellowship with God. But the problem is, typically, we deceive ourselves. That's that's where the real danger lies. We, We think that we're okay with God, even as we walk in darkness. And he says, you're lying. And and you're lying to yourself. You are self-deceived, thinking that you're okay when you're walking in darkness. Why do we engage in wrong actions? Well, we often engage in wrong actions because we decide to. In other words, it's a matter of will. It's a matter of of mind. We make wrong decisions. I'll give you another example to illustrate this point from Isaiah, the 30th chapter in verse 1. On that occasion, God was criticizing Israel because Israel knew she was in trouble, knew the invasion was coming, and she thought that perhaps if she... If she allayed herself or allied herself with Egypt, that the protection of Egypt would would afford them sufficient protection, sufficient help to where they would not be overtaken. And 
what God said in Isaiah 30 and verse 1, Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel, they take advice, but not from me. Notice that. Take advice, but not from me. They devise plans, but not of my spirit, and they add sin to sin. That's what people do. How many times I've heard that? I've, I've recently been in a discussion with a particular individual who this is characteristically the case. It is constantly, I don't see how. It seems to me. Well, in my mind, the way I look at it, those kinds of phrases are completely prevalent. Now, he is one who's willing to acknowledge that what I'm saying is exactly what the Scripture says. We read it, but he just can't see it because of the way he was raised, because he has immersed himself in, in those things, it's hard for him to overcome that. And he's taking advice, he's taking counsel, whether it's his own counsel or another, but it's not from God. And because of that, it is something that is adding sin to sin. And again, so it is a matter of will. I'm choosing to do this instead of what God has for me. And understand this, it is finally a matter of wrong information because the information is not coming from God. They devise plans, but not of my spirit. And going back to Romans chapter 1, that's what was said. They knew God, but they didn't glorify Him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. Their foolish hearts were darkened, and they became fools. It is foolishness to reject the counsel of God, the information that is, that is available to you from God's Word. And so, rather than that alienation from Christ, we have... That learning Christ is where the light comes, and it involves just the opposite. We engage in right actions rather than wrong actions because we have made the decision to obey God rather than to disobey Him, to rebel, to do things of our own bidding, and we know what it is that we are supposed to do because we have the knowledge of God that brings that light, brings that illumination rather than suffering from delusion and suffering from darkness. Walking about in ignorance. And so as we contemplate these things, this particular slide that you'll notice up here involving right actions, right will, right information, I want to enlarge upon that just a little bit. So let's kind of take it in the inverse. Because this is where it starts, having the right information. Notice again what is stated in verses 20 and 21 of Ephesians 4. He says, you have not so learned Christ, if indeed... You have heard him and been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. So first of all, in order to be walking in light rather than darkness, you need to know Jesus. You need to know of Jesus. You need to know what Jesus teaches. John chapter 6 and verse 44, Jesus affirmed this himself. In John 6 verses 44 and 45, he says, No one can come to me. Unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day, it's written in the prophets, they shall be taught by God. The drawing there, everyone who has learned and heard from the Father, he's the one that is drawn to Christ. So how are we drawn to Christ? We're drawn through the gospel, the words that have been been shown to us, revealed to us. The will of God draws us. In John 14, you'll remember Thomas, after Jesus had talked about the many mansions and him going to prepare a place for them, and and when he returns, he'll take them to be there. And they said, they said, uh, Thomas said, well, well, uh, Lord, we don't know where you're going. He said, how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth. And the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. I am the truth. I am the way. That's just a very simple premise. One I want to share with you today. It's one that's so simple you'll have heard it before. But listen to this. If you want to go to heaven, Jesus is the way. If you want to go to heaven, the truth that Jesus has revealed is the way to get there. When Jesus has revealed himself to us, we are then walking in the light. If we indeed use that information as we should, we're walking on that narrow path. And we enter into that straight gate, which leads unto life. And that's something that we need to be aware of. Because so many today are drawn away from God rather than to God. And they are walking in darkness. And so... 
passages that you read. John 1, 14, for example, when we talk about Jesus, he is referred to by John as being the Word, the Word. The Word was God, and the Word, word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. The Word, Jesus as the Word, what's indicated by that? Well, one thing that the Hebrew writer indicates that God in previous times and in various ways, he, he spoke to the fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. When you want to know the final word from God, it is manifested in his son, Jesus Christ. The final covenant that God has given to man is the one that was established and ratified by the blood of Jesus Christ. The final will that we are to submit to is the will of Jesus Christ. The word became flesh, dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Do you remember when Pilate asked Jesus, are you a king then? In John chapter 18 and verse 37 Pilate said, are you a king then? And Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king for to this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And so if you want to be in the light, you want to have that relationship with God where the illumination is present with Christ who brought light into the world, understand this. The way in which you do that is receive the right information. You have to so learn Christ, as our text says. Learn Christ. What does that mean? It is not merely that he is the Son of God. You know, when people talk about faith today, that's what they basically say. What is belief in Jesus Christ? Well, that he lived a life that was perfect, died a sacrificial death, was raised from the dead on the third day, and ascended to the Father. Well, those are the rudiments of the gospel of Christ. In fact, that's, that's what the, uh, uh, the writer of the, the Hebrew letter talked about. Uh, the, the rudiments, but we have to go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation. There are other things that are contained in that truth. Jesus has revealed to us the things he requires of us, how he would have us to live, what we should refrain from, what we should engage in. We learn Christ. We don't just learn about Christ. Let me give you an example of that very simple one in Acts chapter 8, the eunuch. You'll remember as they went on the road... In Isaiah chapter 53, Philip came up to him. And he was reading from the prophet Isaiah chapter 53 about the suffering Savior. And the eunuch asked Philip, he said, who's this man talking about? Is he talking about himself or someone else? And from that passage, that scripture, we are told Philip preached to him Jesus. Preached Jesus. What we're saying there is that he learned Jesus. He learned Christ, at least to a certain extent. He didn't learn all of it in that short statement. But the interesting thing is, he did learn what he had to do to be saved, didn't he? Because as they came to some water after Christ was preached to him, the eunuch said, here is water, what hinders me from being baptized? And you say, wait a minute. Learning baptism isn't learning Christ. Yes, it is. So what Philip was doing when he preached Christ to him, he preached his death, burial, and resurrection. He preached the proper response in faith to what it was that Jesus did for us, how we are to respond in order to gain a relationship with him. It's like the Jews on Pentecost who said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What the eunuch did when he preached Jesus, he preached to the, or excuse me, what Philip did when he preached Jesus, he preached to the eunuch what he should do, and that is be baptized to wash away his sins. And so when we learn Christ, we learn what it is that we are supposed to do. And then the next point is once we learn it, then we have to decide. We have to express our will. We are told in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 23 that these disciples, rather than continuing to walk in darkness as the Gentiles walked, he said you need to have your mind renewed, the renewing of the spirit of your mind. What, what happens to a renewed mind? You know, you know what it means. It means you become new again. So what was growing old becomes new again. It's, it's brand new. And with that renewed mind, then it comes to a renewed life. And, and if you understand that that is the case, 
then there is nothing that you cannot do for the Lord. Romans chapter 12. You'll remember his beseeching. I beseech you therefore, brethren. That's begging. I'm begging you, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now we're getting into action, so we're jumping ahead just a little bit. But why is it that we engage in that right action? Why we sacrifice our bodies to do what is right? To be wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. This is how. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so here, the will has been revealed. It hits your mind. It changes you. And as a result of it changing you, now your actions are commensurate with that change. And you prove yourself. Now, this renewal is what is meant by the term conversion. When we're converted, we become new again. We become a new creature in Christ, as Romans 6 indicates. I want you to look at a passage in Titus chapter 3 very quickly because it is one that is sometimes misunderstood, and I think it's important that we make this point as the lesson continues. Titus 3 verse 3, because it takes it talks about basically the same thing. We once were... Just like as we walked in the Gentiles, Paul here says, We ourselves also were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasure, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That's the darkness. But in verse 4 he says, When the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So there's the reconciliation. Now we are in the light. And he said how he saved us is through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now what is intended by that phrase, the renewing of the Holy Spirit? This newness of mind, this change of will and purpose. Well, it has echoes of John 3. You'll remember that that, uh, our Lord told Nicodemus on that occasion, unless one is born of water and born of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus had a problem with that. He said, how can a man enter again into his mother's womb? And Jesus said, no, you're not getting it. You're not understanding what I'm talking about. It wasn't a physical birth he was talking about, but a spiritual birth, a rebirth to become a new man, one who is reconciled to God. And so I want you to understand what the renewing of the Holy Spirit is. Go to Ephesians 5 very quickly, because I think this is a good divine commentary on what Titus 3 and verses 3 through 5 is saying with the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, you'll remember the the, the comparison, the husband and the wife and their responsibilities, Christ in the church. So he says in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church, gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. So we're sa- the Apostle Paul talking about Christ, he died on the cross so that he could save the church by the washing of water and by the word. So as we go back in there, he says the washing of regeneration, Titus 3, verse 5, washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. You notice it's basically saying the same thing in Ephesians chapter 5. He says as he continues that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy without blemish. That is, that the church, the actions of those who are involved, that they are righteous and good because of this regeneration. So how does the Holy Spirit renew our spirit? How does the Holy Spirit regenerate us? It is through His Word, His will. The gospel is the power of God into salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In other words, we get the right information and based upon that information that we have received, the truth that is contained therein that Jesus Christ died on the cross that he shed his blood, that he was resurrected from the dead, he ascended into heaven, he reigns in his kingdom today, and that as his people, we come to him through repentance and baptism and continue in him by changing our lives, by making a decision that we are going to continually serve him. That's what, and we talked about this in, the, in the, the high school class today in Psalm 51 and verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. How does God create in us a clean heart? Through the Word, through the truth. That's how it is accomplished. I get the right information, and I determine that I'm going to act upon that information. Rather than engaging in ungodliness, rather than corrupting my heart, I'm going to have a clean, a pure, 
and unsullied heart. And that's when we get to the final point. And that is the actions. And in the text of Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 24, he says, First of all, put off the former conduct, the old man. Put off the old man. And then he says in verse 24, put on the new man created by God, created me the clean heart, the new man created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Walking in the light is a walk, brethren. There are so many religious people today that say they love Christ and they have a relationship with Christ and they walk in darkness. They're lying to themselves. They're not practicing the truth. And what we have to do in order to please him is put off that old man which has grown corrupt. Notice in Colossians 3 and verse 5, we're to put to death our members which are on the earth, things like fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Understand this. If you walk characteristic of the world, if your walk is is engaging in ungodly activities, the wrath of God comes upon you because, in effect, you are a son of disobedience. He said, you yourselves once walked that way when you lived in them, but now, but now, this is the way we're to be as Christians. Verse 8, put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Don't lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. Have you put off the old man? See, that's the interesting thing about Colossians 3. It's written to Christians. He's admonishing Christians to put off the old man and be renewed. In other words, though they may have been converted, there were vestiges of that evil that remained in their life. There were some who were not pleasing God, even though they were one of his children, because they persisted in the walk of the Gentiles. The charistic Walk of darkness. And he says, put those things off. Put off the old man. And when you put off the old man, that's the same as putting to death the actions of sin. Notice in Romans 13. He says in verse 12 through 14, The night spent, the days at hand, let us cast off, put off the old man, cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as it is in when? In the day. The proper walk is the walk in light. Again, this this same relationship is being established in this text. In contrast to that, walk properly is in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. Why? Because that's a walk in the night, night, the walk in the darkness. And finally, there in verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, make no provision for the flesh. To fulfill its lusts. And then finally, one other passage in Romans chapter 6 and verses 1 through 4, specifically talking about baptism, specifically talking about what happens once you are converted. He says, shall we continue in sin? You continue walking in darkness? No, God forbid, absolutely not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer? Do you understand that when you become a child of God, you embrace the Lord as your Savior, you embrace the light, there's no way that you could continue to engage in the walks of darkness. Those things are antithetical to one another. And if you do that, though you claim that you have embraced light, you're lying. And it may be you're just lying to yourself. But you're not telling the truth. Because the walk of light is what is characteristic of the people who are in the light. And you cannot be walking in darkness and be in the light. As many as were baptized into Christ were baptized to his death. Therefore, we're buried with him through baptism into death, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of light. When we become children of God, everything is different. We are illuminated. We are walking in truth. We have the right information now. We have made that determination of will that we would no longer make provision for the flesh But instead, our will has changed, and now we walk in the light. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All all things have become new. It's a, a life of light rather than a light of darkness. 
And so we hope and pray that you understand the significance of this. The Apostle Paul is not giving some suggestions. It would be better for you if you lived your life in this way rather than that. We're talking about things that are of eternal import. You can't be in the light if you are walking in darkness. And so as we draw our lesson to a close, there's a final passage that I would like you to note. A warning and a promise is found here in 1 John 1. We made an allusion to it earlier in our lesson. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. That's the warning. That's the warning. That's the first thing that I want you to understand. Examine your life. Examine your heart. Examine your will, your actions, your speech, your language. And just ask yourself, what kind of walk is characteristic of me? I claim to be a child of God. I claim to be a Christian. I claim to be doing right. And yet look at me. Am I walking in the light or not? Because if you're not, you're lying. And you're not practicing the truth. He warns us. There has to be a consistency with your claims and the reality of your situation. But here's the promise. And we want to leave you with that in verse 7. If we walk in the light. As he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's the promise. We walk in the light. We are acceptable to God. If we walk in the light, we have the hope of eternity in the light. In the presence of God. Where there is no need for sun or moon. Because the Lamb, the Lamb of God, is the illumination. And because of that, it is a place of glory. You remember the, the contrast that is given between heaven and hell in Scripture? Again, what is it? Light and darkness. We talk about the fact that we will rejoice, we'll be happy, there will be no tears in heaven. And the reason for that is because we're in the presence of God. We are in the light. But how is hell described? Hell is described as outer darkness. Outer darkness, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. A place of weeping and wailing. Why? Because God's not there. The darkness is complete. It is a horrific place. And that's not where you want to be. And so we offer an invitation to all who are here today so that you will note what is significant, what is needed. Walk in the light, not in darkness. Let us heed the admonition of Paul from Ephesians 4 and strive to live our lives righteously before him. If we can assist you in that, we offer ourselves to you at this time. We don't know your heart. It, it may be that you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. You may be like, like that eunuch, uh, as we talked about in Acts chapter 8, who first had Christ preached to him. And he said, well, here's water. What, what keeps me from being baptized? Remember what Philip's answer to that was? He said, if you believe, you may. And the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That eunuch... He asked the question, what must I do? And Philip told him to be baptized. If you believe, we must believe, we must turn away from our sins. Peter said in Acts chapter 2, repent and let everyone be baptized in the name of Father, in the name of Christ for the remission of your sins. And we must do that as well. If you believe, and you're sorry for your sins, and you want to determine to live righteously from now on, you're willing to stand before those who are assembled today and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then you can be baptized and wash away your sins and rise to walk in newness of life. That's life and light. But it may be that there is someone who is here today, some darkness has crept in. There is something that is unresolved in your life. You haven't completely dedicated yourself. You've been lying to yourself, and you need to make a change. If that's the case, make it today. It, it doesn't have to be in front of us necessarily. I mean, you can go to your closet and pray to God, and God, who is a righteous God, will forgive you of your sins as you confess them before him. But if we can encourage you or help you in some way, if we can help you be better, you want to come forward and express that desire and that need, we'll pray for you now. We will assist anyone here who has a need to help them be in the light. We, we offer ourselves to you today. So if the invitation is extended and you have a need, then please come. While together we stand and while we sing.